This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. What's up, Stephen King fans? This is Stephen, your host from Fantology, along with my lifelong friend, Josh. And it's just us two today, and we have a more unique episode. And honestly, I'm not really sure what we're doing today, Josh. So I'm going to let you lead out, and I will uh, kind of take the back seat uh, to, on, on this one. Yeah, so I figure that today is going to be kind of like a Why You Should Read episode slash me pitching this story, this trilogy to Stephen. Um, this series in question is the is the Bill Hodges trilogy um, that starts with Mr. Mercedes, and then it has uh, Finders Keepers and End of Watch. Uh, so they're okay. kind of newer works from Stephen King. Um, I think that they were started in... I should have had this ready. I mean, from what I've seen from Stephen King, I, I don't know if I've read a single Stephen King book, which, you know... Could, probably my bad, right? But from what I've seen, he seems to book out like a, a book a year or, you know, pr pretty, yeah, yeah, a, a ton of stuff. So this is on the newer side of things for him. Yeah, this is on the newer, I think like 20, I want to say like 2013, 15, something like that. Um, and, oh, 20, 2014, right in the middle there. So 2014, 2015, 2016, knocked, knocked all three out in three different years. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, and they all take place um, kind of in the Stephen King likes to make most of his books besides like the Dark Tower series well even some of the Dark Tower series kind of just in the current world that we live in with like current technology like so and it's really mm -hmm. referencing you know tech that's you know, popular in the time frame so um, you know he'll like reference what kinds of phone their phones they're using and talk about Twitter. Okay. Just kind of like things like that. So it really does feel like kind of like a 2014 type book. That's why it kind of you know, narrowed down pretty close. So so a little different than our usual epic fantasy book reviews. This Stephen King mostly writes speculative fiction. Is that how you would categorize it sure. kind of broad strokes what he writes? Yeah. Sure. So he does have some what I would categorize as um epic fantasy with the dark tower trilogy right which is still has a unique take on epic fantasy for sure like there are epic fantasy elements but then there's other just really kind of uh not epic fantasy elements in it so he that but that would be his staple what you would refer to as epic fantasy um and the other is yeah like like i would i like speculative fiction um i would define them as thrillers more than anything like okay they're pretty fast paced. This is just broad strokes. Fast paced. Um, you know, you're you're following a retired cop as he tries to track down. Uh, a, a, I don't know if I would classify him as a serial killer, but as a, like a killer. And there's you know a time, a, click, a ticking clock in all three books that they you know that's kind of at the end of it something a disaster is going to happen. They're trying to prove mm -hmm. it. Um, so they're for sure page turners and there are fantasy elements and there are elements that tie into Stephen King's greater, you know, multiverse that he has, that he has written. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very loose tie-ins, I would say. Uh, just his kind of magic system that he likes to use reverberates throughout all of his books where people kind of can just have psychic powers slash um into like more than what normal intuition would provide okay and there's always kind of like evil balancing with good on like kind of how much these powers are given to people mm. but that's it's all pretty background anyway that's a pretty long answer to your question but yeah 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 um, well i mean that kind of lead you know leads into what we're talking about um the the, the first book is called mr mercedes but the trilogy itself is called what again uh I'm seeing it referred to a lot as the Bill Hodges trilogy, which is what I referred to it as. Bill okay. Hodges is the main detective type character, retired cop that's in uh, that. Well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, that is a main character sure. throughout the series. So. And, and so I don't have a lot of experience with Stephen King. Like I said, I've never actually read any of his books and I kind of know what some of the stories are. Like I've seen the Carrie movie. 
but I don't really love horror that much. And, and that's, I think that's what the, your average person off the street is going to think like, oh, Stephen King, he's the guy who writes all the horror books. Yeah. But not all of his books are in that vein, right? Like, it sounds like this is more in the thriller, but a lot of it, a lot of his books do delve into more like dark supernatural type things. Yeah. So that's why I kind of wanted to pitch you on these books is, well, I don't think that these are the, probably anywhere near close to the best Stephen King books. I think that they're very approachable Stephen King books that still get you like a kind of Stephen King taste um, in terms of tone and characters. And they do a lot of what Stephen King does well. They do it well. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that they're the best of his works, but I think if you wanted to start reading Stephen King and you weren't ready to commit to like a behemoth like it, then this could be something or like the entire Dark Tower trilogy or something or mm-hmm. Dark Tower five books or whatever, however many are in there, then this could be a way that you could kind of dip your toes in to the Stephen King multiverse. For some reason, I'm thinking there's seven Dark Tower books, but I, but I haven't read them. There, but I, I remember doing research on this with you. I be. think when, when we were reviewing, we did a similar review for Dark Tower where I hadn't read it and Josh was kind of pitching me on the series. I want yeah. to say there were seven, but I I, don't uh, know. I, I tend to remember little details yeah. like that. <laughs> there, there's a lot. And then there's like some graphic novels and short stories that also take mm. place. So it depends if you count those. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that's why I figured like, that's a pretty big ask to, you know, to jump into Dark Tower. And I wouldn't even recommend somebody jump into Dark Tower because there's um, characters that are in Dark Tower from other books um, that you should probably read before you read Dark Tower. But um, I think that this could be a place that you could kind of start with Stephen King. Mm. Um, yeah, the approachability, that makes a lot of sense as far as recommendations. Like the other day, I was recommending Epic Fantasy to a friend who just, you know, had like read Harry Potter as a kid and was like looking to maybe read something else. And I recommended Mistborn. And if you've listened to our episode where you and I talked about book recommendations, you know, I think it's something that gets thrown around a lot. And, and Mistborn is a, a one that we like to go to because it's a trilogy and because the first book is kind of self-contained and it's like fairly approachable in terms of nothing too crazy is happening right off the bat. Like it's not crazy complicated or anything like it. Yes, it is an epic fantasy world in Mistborn, but it's not like super weird, wacky out there. And, and so it sounds like maybe if, if I'm going to read a Stephen King book, you might recommend this one for similar reasons as a novice yeah. Stephen King reader. It, I'll say it this way. If you were only, if you said, I'm only going to read one Stephen King book, I wouldn't recommend this one. I would recommend one of his more classic ones. Okay. But if you said, I'm interested in starring Stephen King, I'm not sure I want to commit to a huge book, then I would say, hey, Mr. Mercedes is, might be a good place to start because mm. it's... The first book is fairly self-contained. You could only read that one. If you each book is like, I I listen to all of them, so they're like, I think twelve hours, so they're pretty, you know, short. Okay, okay. Like you can get through most of them. Yeah. So here's a question about Stephen King. So he's been writing books since what, like the '80s, at least, you know, the '70s, years, I think '70s maybe. Yeah, years and years. Um, and I'm gonna reveal, you know, my limited understanding of Stephen King, but. He's known for, in my mind, a lot of adaptations, a lot of movie adaptations that have made of his books. Things like it, he wrote The Shining, right? That's Stephen King. Yeah. Uh, What what are some other ones? I guess. Like you said, Carrie, Pet Sematary, uh, The Stand. I'm trying to think of other big adaptions. Um, Yeah. So so these ones all, these are things that I've been around for a while. All of the ones that he's super well known for. Kind of makes sense because they got made into adaptations, which means the books have to be around for a while for them to be popular enough for for networks to get behind. Like, oh yeah, let's make an adaptation for this thing. But what I'm trying to lead to in this long-winded intro to the question is, is his newer stuff that he's still coming out with, do you think any of this newer stuff, and, and I know you haven't read all of it, but stuff like this uh, Mr. Mercedes book, um, are these ones going to be you know 10 years down the road however are are these going to be as renowned or as well known or do you think his classical stuff like is that really what his legacy is going to be 
So that's a great question. So in terms of the adaptions, I also always throw out Shawshank and Redemption and Green Mile because those are all maybe two mm. of those best. But so these have already been adapted. Um, there's a there's a trilogy or there's three seasons of a Mr. Mercedes TV show oh, wow. that okay. I, I haven't seen. And then The Outsider, which is another one of his newer books and has a crossover character from this series who is maybe one of my favorite Stephen King characters, um, is also in that series, is also in that mm-hmm. The Outsider was on HBO. I haven't watched either of them, um, but I have heard The Outsider was really good. Okay. I've read that book. So, um, so you know, um, I think that to answer your question, it's it's hard. I don't think that this will be considered one of Stephen King's great works. It's for sure not going to be. Like, it's not going to be, you know, make a list of top five great Stephen King books, top five books that mm-hmm. change literature. It's just not, it's not meant to be that. Like, it's meant to be, you know, I, I have an afternoon or a weekend. I want to sit down and read a fast-paced, fun action book that's going to leave me on the edge of my seat every chapter and okay. really finish feeling you know like i just kind of like a dresden book like mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and maybe dresden's different because i think that dresden as a whole um it has changed fantasy and, and will be renowned as like a great fantasy series but like each individual book by itself like you, you don't feel like you just read a masterpiece you know sure okay you you feel like you sat down and you had a really good time and and it kept you on the edge of your seat, you know? Mm. Um, I think that's kind of what these books are. They're not Stephen King masterpieces, um, but they are fun, fun, good reads that, uh, that do a lot of, like I said earlier, they have really great characters and they just have a lot of Stephen King isms. So, um, but yeah, they're not, it's not uh, shining for sure. So it sounds like he, he stays true to the Stephen Kingisms that you referenced. A lot of things that that you can see as someone who's read a lot of his books, you can see a lot of similar threads throughout. Yet it's a different genre, or it's a different way of writing, or just one that he doesn't write as often. Is that true? Yeah, it's hard because Stephen King has these classics that I think he. Um, I I don't I'm not like a huge Stephen King scholar, but I know that he like sat on so like Pet Cemetery for a long time before deciding to publish it because it was so horrifying to him, which mm. I which for me Pet Cemetery was his most horrifying of books, and I know that he wrote The Stand for like years and years and and uh, was stuck writing The Stand for a really long time, and. These books, like, there's no way that somebody's going to get stuck writing one of these books. Like, you know, you just write the next chapter of it type thing. Okay. Um, so it is, I think that Stephen King earlier in his career was working on writing what a lot of people would see as masterpieces. And now he's just, he's writing um, fun stories that are that are consumable and well done. Hmm. So. Okay. Interesting. Like, he's got to the point where... I mean, I could see that like with, with any career, right? Like you kind of build your career, you work really hard, you get into your forties, fifties, you're like, oh man, I've been doing this for a while. I've kind of, you know, I've, I've made some money. I'm like, I'm, I'm doing okay. And so maybe if you like writing, you keep on doing it, but it's not like, you don't have to really, I don't know, like invest that emotional weight into everything you write it. You, yeah. he's, he's skilled enough where he can, be producing quality stuff without the same amount of meaning behind it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm, no, it's, maybe it's I'm true. selling it short. I, I'm just trying to guess at what this, what, where we're going here. Yeah. Let, let me compare something. So um, the Shawshank Redemption, which I've never actually read the Shawshank Redemption book, but I've seen the movie. So it's mm-hmm. a super, super powerful look at recidivism, you know, like somebody going, being um, in jail for a long time, they get out. Have you seen the shot? Can I spoil the Shawshank? Uh, I actually Shawshank never. Spoil? I actually never have. <laughs> okay, so it's a it's a very tragic look at the prison system and re- recidivism, um, and it was very powerful when I watched the movie. You know, like it made me, mm-hmm. you know, want to get behind like prison reform and get you know like work with all the work with businesses to like help people get jobs and have meaning after going to prison and all this stuff. Like it, it had a big impact on me. 
this book also has a character that was um, like one of the villains in the second book has a character that was in prison for most of their life, gets out of prison and just be, continues his villainous ways. Like it has nowhere near the impact while dealing with similar themes, but like mm. Stephen, he wasn't interested in examining how society treats, you know, former criminals. Like he was just like, okay, here's a, here's a villain that's been in jail for a long time. Okay. If, if that makes any sense, like one is a super uh-huh, powerful, uh-huh. But, but I don't know which one's better. Like I'm saying, I don't know if you should read the Shawshank Redemption because it's really heavy and it's, it's, I don't, it's not an easy book that you want to sit down for a weekend uh-huh. and read, you know? So. Yeah. Okay. So I guess what we're saying is, you know, some of his books are more literary classics and, and there's reasons for that. But like, if you look at, if you examine literary classics over the ages, like they all have hard hitting themes and they explore into human nature and there's real deep kind of poignant things about these books but there are also a whole genre of books that are like thrillers and exciting and and uh don't have those things but are also like just as good depending on what you're in the mood for so yeah i i guess it's it's uh a think, sign that you're a good author if you're able to write in a lot of different types of books. I think maybe a good comparison, and I'm not a huge like Charles Dickens scholar either, like, but he has some works that are just like classics, right? Like all times, all time they're going down as literary classics. Nobody can really deny that. But then he would also just write like weekly serials that were like just kind of meant to be, you know, consumed in mass and quickly. You know, it's not mm. like every single thing that Charles Dickens wrote uh, was, you know, the, the end-all be-all literary classic. So. Okay. I like the comparison. I don't know much about Charles Dickens, <laughs> uh, to be honest. I think I did the uh, great, illustrated, great Illustrated Classic version of what, Great Expectations? I Yeah. Yeah, which is like the Sparknotes equivalent when I was, was it, in junior was- high. Did they always read it that going into freshman year? I think that was like summer reading going into freshman uh-huh. year. Going into freshman yeah. year of high school. Yeah. That was that was rough. Yeah. I did not read the book. Uh probably still got a good grade on whatever the assignment was. <laughs> and here I am doing a podcast talking about reading books. So yep. explain that, high school English teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um well okay, so back to a little bit more pitching pitching the book series um it opens and i'll keep it you know spoiler light because you haven't read sure it. so um it opens with um a with a terrorist attack based like where a guy drives a mercedes through like a crowd of people and kills you know a dozen people or something and injures mm. a, a ton more and so that's how it opens that's why it's called mr mercedes um uh-huh. The cop that's assigned to try and find this guy, um, well, it skips like maybe five years later or something. And the cop that was assigned to find this guy retires. He gets a note from the Mercedes killer, from Mr. Mercedes, as he's been dubbed, and um, is like, ha, 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 you didn't find me. Like, you should probably just kill yourself, type thing, because now you're retired and da, da, da. And so, and that's kind of like the premise of the first book. And, and mm. so, um, and then it jumps to you're also in the in the viewpoint of this of the killer, and you get why you know you get his perspective and how kind of messed up of a person he is, and you learn more about his life and how you know why why he is what the way he is. So it's pretty mm. interesting. That's the first book. I should also put a content warning out there for you and for anybody else that wants to read. Obviously, like Stephen King deals with some pretty heavy things, um, and there's like um references to incest and it's a pretty brutal look at stuff um you know i think you, obviously you'd be able to handle it but i just want to throw it out there like if we have younger audience you know it's it's for sure there there is mm-hmm. a good amount of content in the book um does, so you, does stephen that. king have have any books that are like lower age th- barrier like not as much content or are they all i mean fairly, fairly adult i would say everyone i've read is fairly adult like 
Yeah, maybe the first Dark Tower book. No, that has adult stuff in it. Hmm. Yeah, it's all pretty adult. And none, none of it is crazy. Like he doesn't have uh, like explicit sex scenes, is but but he references like like I was. There's a theme of incest throughout this book, which is pretty intense. Okay. You know? And there, I, depending on what you classify as incest, it's not like he has a full chapter describing like a sex scene or something like that. Like it's if something happens, it it's more of like a Joe okay. Abercrombie look at sex, where it's pretty kind of more realistic than like smutty. I would say. Sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. So that's through the first book, and then the next the rest of the trilogy like continues the same story uh yeah so it's kind of interesting um the second book takes a pretty big detour and for most of the book it's centered on um this it juxtaposizes this guy who um when he was a kid or when he was like a young adult maybe like early 20s he um again this is like a chapter or a spoiler for like the first chapter of the second book but he okay. kills this like super famous author, um, kind of like a Stephen King type person who wrote uh-huh. this like amazing trilogy that everybody that was like renowned and everybody loved. And then the third book, this guy hated what the guy did to the character in the third book, thought that he like desecrated the character, goes in, kills the author and steals like a bunch of um, his books. And then he goes to jail, but he, he had hid like all these manuscripts so flash forward like 40 years into the future, this kid that's living in his old house finds these manuscripts, becomes obsessed with this series, and then the guy gets out of prison and it's like, it's kind of like this kid and this like older criminal facing off going after these like manuscripts. And then hmm. the former detective also gets pulled into it. Um, okay. But it, it takes a pretty big detour because like the first half of the book like none of the same characters that were in the first book are in the second book for until like halfway through. Mm. It's kind of interesting, Okay, but I really like the second book. I like the juxtaposition of these two characters and how you could see like maybe the good guy, like if he had like a one, he becomes like super obsessed with this author as well, because he's the only one that has read the continuation of the story. Um, and he can't really share it with anyone for reasons, uh. for plot reasons, but um, you get, you get you you realize that like here's this good upstanding kid that like maybe if something had gone differently he might have turned into this criminal that's chasing him. Uh, oh yeah, like, okay. Come after him. So it, it's right, just it's right. pretty interesting. Yeah, and again, mm. like these characters are really really well written, um, and very compelling. So Stephen King is basically killing himself in yeah in that's the second it. book. Well, you can't really say that because. Stephen King writes himself into the Dark Tower series. So right, I remember that. Stephen King is a character, so Stephen King does not kill Stephen King, but Stephen King kills a Stephen King, kind of <laughs> Stephen King stand-in, I guess. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So is there actually a supernatural element? I guess if, it's, if yes. it's a big plot thing, maybe don't spoil it. But Yeah, so it becomes a bigger plot thing in the third book. Um, the supernatural element okay. uh, becomes much bigger in the third book. Mm. the third so book des- s- descends rag- into like a full-on kind of yeah i i don't want to spoil it for you because mm. okay don't okay. spoil it the first book okay because your initial description made it seem like it was just more of a, a fictional thriller yeah but it the, gets more into the fantasy side throughout yeah throughout the first two books there's not a whole lot of um there's not a whole lot of uh fantasy elements of it but for most mm-hmm. of the third book it a major plot device is um a character's ability to use like uh esp and and kind of take over people okay i'll just say it like that like mm. yes and okay um it also there, there's also just like some stephen king elements of like kind of these good forces working like inspiring people to know what to like what the next steps are and so there's like some very light forms of um of fantasy when it comes to that element of it but um that's only if you've read a lot of stephen king books you can kind of recognize when these good forces fantastical 
forces are working and when these evil fantastical forces are working. Okay. So I know Stephen King, maybe this is not always the case, but my impression of Stephen King is that the endings of his books are controversial and received in different ways by different people. So obviously I don't want you to spoil the ending, but uh, did you like how this one ended? <laughs> yeah. So these were all, I was pleasantly surprised with each of these endings. I still hold that it's kind of Stephen King's, it's just not his focus. He, he doesn't build towards like every single, like he might end a plot element halfway through the book. And then like that, that's over and doesn't really tie in to the rest of the book. Mm, he just okay. like wraps it up, you know, before the end. So not Whereas, nearly the same, like Brandon Sanderson structure where everything matters and kind of all contributes to this, like, big climactic thing that everything ties in together so not yeah not that basically yeah it's it's like if this were a brand new sanction that book then like a page from these manuscripts that were in the second book would like give them a clue to how to stop the villain at the yeah. end of the third book and right. the book would have been like sitting you're like the kid would have been carrying the backpack with the books in it like in the very first book and one scene you know like that's mm -hmm. how brandon Sanderson would like to do it stephen king is like no, that wouldn't happen in the real world. So we just have these like really well-written characters that are going to act as really mm. well-written characters would. And that means by necessity that it's not all, everyone's not going to fit together like a puzzle piece because normal characters wouldn't fit together like a puzzle piece, I guess. Yeah, it's um, a good way to put it. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah earlier today I was working on a, uh, working on the outline for the book that I hope to one day write. And I was very much leaning more into the Brandon Sanderson side of things where it's like, okay, well, I've got to like get all these plot things together. It's like, it's all got to be relevant at the end for the climax. And I'm very much like OCD like that. So I think anything I write probably will happen that way. But yeah, there are a lot of really good character, more character focused books where like the wheel of time is another good example lots of great characters lots of, you know the plot's not bad but there's a lot of plot elements that are just you know like important for a book or two and then they're just kind of done and it's on to the next thing the, the bowl of wins yeah that's a good example <laughs> yes yeah yeah I, I agree um and i i think that's a hard line to draw because um I don't know which I enjoy reading more. Like there is a lot of catharsis in Brandon Sanderson's endings, but it nece necessarily requires characters making decisions that like mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't have made if they weren't like compelled to via plot reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I will ponder this more as I develop my book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um yeah yeah last things any, i'm trying to think of anything else i would that would make you really want to jump into this uh series i i just really can't hit enough how well done the characters are there's one character in specific holly um who is a i don't know if he had planned her being like a main i think he did but i don't know if he had planned her on being a main fixture throughout the entire trilogy and She's the character that crosses over into The Outsider, which is another one of his books. But mm. she's just very compelling. She's written um, to have autism and OCD, I believe. Um, and just the way that they work, the way that he uh, works with these characters is fantastic. Another amazing thing that Stephen King does is pulls in characters that you wouldn't think work well together, and he makes them work really well together. Uh, if you've you've seen it, right? Have you seen any of the it movies? Or no, I just know I just know it's a clown. It's no and yeah, yeah, and it, he has these group of kids, the losers, which they're all so different, but they all complement each other so well. And like the Dark Tower, you have um, like a author authorian knight type character who's the gunslinger, and then you have a um, like a drug addict, and then you have a like older not super older like um maybe middle-aged black woman who um was hit by a who i'm 
trying to remember what she was hit by. It's a plot element, so I might not want to spot. Anyway, who's disabled, mm-hmm. can't walk, is in, is in a wheelchair. And okay. you just like have like all these, and then like a talking dog. And that like forms the basis of this of this group of people that like go and like do fantastic things together. It's just so interesting on how he's able to pull all these characters together. And this, you have like a retired detective, a um, woman who has autism and OCD, and then like this uh, black teenager who's just like graduating high school and they like go and, and like work so well together hmm. and make this wonderful team. Like they just, mm-hmm. he pulls together these characters in such amazing ways. And I just, I think he, that's one of, as I've read a lot of Stephen King books, that's a standout ability that he has is pulling okay. in characters that you wouldn't think will work well together that are fully formed in their own right. And because they're fully formed in their own right, they're able to come together and make a team that really, um, like each one has brings their own unique things to the ta- table. You would, and it just works really well. So that's all I'm going to say. I like it. Okay. Yeah. So his ability to establish chemistry and, and maybe the characters don't always have like great chemistry between each other, but they're all realistic enough where it all kind of works and they have real human relationships. Yeah. Exactly. It's again, contrasting that with Sanderson, it's like bridge four Sanderson did that well. Right. But like each character in bridge four, they get, I guess they get more developed because you have, you know, four books of thousand thousand page long books that they, that by Mm -hmm. necessity, you learn more about the characters. But if I were to read like one sentence or one paragraph from a bridge four crewman, I might not know who it comes from, right? Like, sure. unless it's, unless it's, you know, somebody with a very distinctive, like the Lopin mm-hmm. or something with a very distinctive way of speaking. But like within one sentence or w- one statement from most of King's books, if you had just read the book, you would like know immediately who said it. And I mean, to be fair, doing. Bridge Four is like, you know, tertiary characters. Yeah. Stormlight, but yeah, I, I, I was I, just thinking of like a group of characters that work well together. Uh-huh. But even with Sanderson, I, I would say maybe even too. like like I'm reading Mistborn right now. We're both actually reading. You just yeah. finished Well of Ascension. I'm I'm in Well of Ascension right now. I would say the crew from Mistborn. Yeah, you know, like there are sure distinct characters, but yeah, if I was to like read a statement from Breeze or Bruce. versus yeah, clubs versus Docs, like. Yes, there are differences, but they're not like, they're just not realized enough to where they really jump out off the page. And I really like care what the differences are between some of these characters because they really just kind of like serve to move the plot along for Vin and Ellen and everyone else. Yeah. Well, really just, yeah, there's not a whole lot of main characters. Anyway, I love Mistborn. Yeah. I, I I was reading Mistborn concurrently with these books. And so I'm not, I don't want to make a value call in which I like more because honestly, I would probably come down the side of saying I like Mistborn more. And that's not why we're talking about these. You know, I don't right. want to pitch Mistborn because I'm not. No, I th- yeah, I but think like, we're just trying to come up with a contrast between, you know, yeah. King's style versus Sanderson's. Uh, I mean, we didn't set out to <laughs> compare to Sanderson at the start of this episode. It's just a really good baseline because so many of our listeners are really familiar with how he writes. Yeah. And and that's the thing. If you go in expecting more of like a Sanderson type or just like that's not what King does and that's not really what the style of book does. It's not setting out to create this whole immersive world. It's setting it like the world is our world for the most part with like some fantastic like some mm-hmm. fantastical undertones which depending on your belief system like you might think that that's not even fantasy that's just like real life and you know that um and that's just what he does. Like, that's what he's not out there to try and be super immersive with the world. He's out there to be super immersive with the characters. Okay. And he does that really well. Whereas Sanderson is sets out to be really immersive with the world and have good characters within that world. Yeah. And he does that really well. So Sanderson's probably a good contrast. If we're trying to do more of a comparison side of things, how much have you read all of John Crombie's books? Did yeah. you read Asia, Asia Madness? Okay, so we're both current through all of Abercrombie's stuff. 
And we would both agree that Abercrombie writes characters really, really well, really, uh-huh. really well realized characters. As you're describing Stephen King, I'm thinking like, okay, there's a lot of similarities here between Abercrombie throwing t- characters together of different backgrounds. And the difference is obviously Abercrombie is very much epic fantasy. It's a world of his creation. It is certainly not Earth. It's more, it's not modern times. But at the same time, like, the plot is not as heavy as a Sanderson type book. There is certainly a plot, and Abercrombie's gotten better at that as his, yeah. you know, as he's written more books. But how would you compare the King experience and the Abercrombie experience? Yeah, very, very favorite, very familiar. I think would be the the right way to say it. I think if you're an Abercrombie fan, you would be much more likely to be a Stephen King fan than like if you're just a Brandon Sanderson fan. Mm. Um, to the point where I'd be like, if I if I had to pick an author, which this wouldn't happen because Abercrombie is like 30 years younger than Stephen King. But if I had to pick somebody to like finish up an Abercrombie series, I think Stephen King would probably be my like top pick for it. Mm. Um, or vice, almost vice versa. Like if Stephen King, I don't think he has any mm. outstanding, really big, you know, series going on. But like, I think Abercrombie would do a good job writing Stephen King characters. Huh. Um, the, yeah, pretty, pretty similar. Um the last thing I want to say about Stephen King is he really makes you examine your own humanity, or at least I do. Um, that's, I'm always like impacted on a more like personal level than I am when I read epic fantasy. Cause I think I'm putting myself in the character's shoes more. Um, and okay. that's partly why a lot of the horror really lands for Stephen King for me, because the characters are like, normal people start off being normal people less so in Mm. the series maybe but like in the shining like it's this this author that just wants to provide for his family that gets shipped up like that takes a job out of necessity up to take care of like um a cabin or not a cabin a hotel that's in the winter nobody can get to like he's just there with his family taking care of the Mm -hmm. hotel and then like the isolation and other paranormal things drive him insane and like that's like <clears throat> something I don't think that would happen to me because I like to think I'm more like mentally stable than that. But like if you're just I think if anybody you don't know how you're gonna locked up if you're just locked up in like this, you know, creepy place for months on end and you know, these kind of these things start happening to you, you don't know how you're gonna respond. Same thing with like Pet Cemetery. There's a tragedy that happens to like a young father where um he, it just like slowly drives him crazy. Like, I think that's that's very. Mm. There are these fantastical horror elements, but that to me is what really drives it home. What what really makes mm-hmm. it scary and lasting to me when I whenever I read a Stephen King book. And that's a little bit less so in these books, but still definitely present. So, would you say that because epic fantasy has this additional? layer of it's not earth and there's magic in your face and all that like those things make it exciting and fun to read and everything but that layer of separation between your life as a human on earth make it a little bit harder to have that like same resonation resignation resonance resonance is the word i'm going for yeah yeah personally yeah yeah definitely and that's I apply that. I think that's why it's really hard for me to get into shows like Breaking Bad and Ozark, because again, these are shows that like, who knows? I could be, I could be that guy, right? Like you're just trying to provide for your family. And then all of a sudden you have this like huge, you know, 90 degree turn happen. And now you're suddenly like wrapped up with criminals. Like, yeah, that, that could happen. You know, I, I like to think (laughs) that wouldn't happen to me, but like it could, right. I don't know. Like out of nowhere, you're suddenly like being threatened by a mob boss to come up to wash this money for him. Otherwise, he's going to kill your family. Like, yeah, I would probably do it or find it. You know, like you. Uh huh. That's why it, it's harder for me to write to watch these things and to consume that media because it it is it resonates with me a lot more, like you said. Mm. And when I do, it sticks with me a lot more than a lot of like epic fantasy. So. Okay. Good point. I like it. Okay, good discussion. Uh, This has been a pitch 
of Mr. Mercedes and I forget the rest of the trilogy the, name. The but, Bill uh, Hodges. Bill Hodges. Yeah. So if you're interested at all in this, uh, check out Stephen King. If you want to talk with us more, Josh and I and the rest of the Phantology crew, you can do that. The link to our Discord is in the description. And uh, I don't know, let us know your take on any of this. I thought this was kind of an interesting, interesting discussion about, I mean, we talked a little bit about the series, but it was mostly about like what makes books different, what makes things interesting or, or not, which I, I guess we want to try to like get at these bigger ideas in any of these discussions. So uh, nicely yeah. done. Thank you, Josh. Also, also, I just want to throw out a disclaimer. If I like messed up some Stephen King trivia or something, just comment it if you feel the need. I didn't really prepare a whole lot on looking at, you know, uh -huh. a lot of dates and stuff. I'm not, I don't claim to be like a Stephen King expert. So come on Discord if you want to talk. We do have some way bigger Stephen King fans on Discord. For sure. And and feel free to draw a comment correct, correcting me, I guess. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Stephen. I, I really enjoyed it tonight. And I guess it kind of turned into why you should read Stephen King as well as why you should read uh, Bill Hodges. But yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you later. All right. Thanks, all.